onto the shore. Now I received a three and a half page resume of tonight's speaker. I figured instead I would ask this question. Does anybody not know Tom Bolt? Great. Thomas, you're up. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Tom. And I want to say how excited I am to be here. It was a lot of fun putting this presentation together. And I hope you enjoy it as much as uh, I did putting uh, all the uh, materials together. Before I get started, I'd like to recognize a couple of people. My parents are here tonight. My wife and my technical assistant, my daughter, uh, is here. And they, they put up with a lot of this craziness that has taken over my body since 1985. So uh, I appreciate their, their patience. And in many ways, they've helped my passion for Houdini and history. And you're here tonight to hear a little bit about Houdini and Appleton, but you also have a passion for history, which is a wonderful thing. Just a brief background, too, of how all this started. I, I wasn't a magician at nine years old. I uh, got involved with the whole Houdini uh, thing in 1985 when Houdini Plaza was organized, and I met a wonderful gentleman who became a dear family friend by the name of Sid Radner. And Sid and I conspired to do a lot of fun things together, and together we also, uh, I think, did some great things to promote Houdini and to keep Houdini's name alive. I would also like to recognize Bruce Hetzler, who's here tonight. Bruce helped uh, with a young magician's group and was always very, very helpful in sharing his talent for magic and made me appreciate more the art as well as some of the importance of showmanship. So Bruce, I'm really happy to see you here tonight. Glad you could, uh, could be with us tonight. So let's get started and I'd like to talk a little bit more about Houdini comes to Appleton, America and the world. Here's a uh, map of Appleton in 1874. It's uh, very well known and we've seen this before. Um, this is something that uh, is showing a growing community and uh, a vibrant, vibrant city. And just to show some photographs that are fairly uh, uh, well known, uh, downtown Appleton College Avenue um, and the uh, Fox River where there are a number of mills and this is the economy moving forward in the 1870s. To get one of the myths out of the way right away, and this idea was Houdini born in Appleton or not, in the 1960s, the Society of American Magicians set uh, uh, out to get a committee to probe this question because there were a number of different uh, theories that were out there. Houdini talked about being born in Appleton, what's going on, and a well-known magician by the name of Milboy Christopher went to Budapest, Hungary, and found uh, a birth certificate that uh, definitively proved that Houdini had, born, had been born in Budapest, Hungary. And something that I hadn't really seen before, and I looked at this many, many times, but as I look at this, this is a rather modern looking uh, uh, piece of paper. And if you look at the dates, it's not 18 something, it's 19 something. So we actually don't have a facsimile or the document where this affidavit came from Budapest. This was something that was produced in the 60s and then has been uh, brought forward as proof positive that uh, Eric Weiss, soon to be known as Harry Houdini, was actually born in Budapest, Hungary. So I want to put that uh, myth aside, but I thought it was interesting to see what was going on with that change uh, going forward. Now, uh, Eric uh, grew up in Budapest, and uh, for the first four years of his life he was there. His father was Rabbi Samuel Meyerweiss, and had been educated at a German university in law, and uh, was uh, known as a scholar. 
And he's the reason why the family moved to America and ultimately on to Appleton. And uh, in 19, or excuse me, 1876, uh, Meyer Samuel uh, moved to uh, America, and that was two years before the family uh, came over. And as I did my research, uh, the miter that he is wearing is uh, one that would identify him as a German Reformed Judaism. So I'm not Jewish, but that would identify him with a particular uh, uh, section of, of uh, the Jewish faith. And this, was, this photograph was taken in Appleton. He's a very distinguished looking fellow and uh, was uh, quite uh, uh, well respected when he came. But uh, that was in uh, coming to America in 1876. We don't know the reasons why other than uh, looking for a job. Uh, he found a job in Appleton in 1878 and sent for the family. And they came over uh, uh, to the United States. This was a uh, Post Crescent article from 1878 talking about the meeting of the uh, Jewish congregation at the Odd Fellows Hall which is the Gabriel Furniture Building, if anybody uh, knows that. And you can see on the uh, bottom of this, it says, Our Israel-like uh, friends have the services of an able rabbi, the Reverend Mr. Wise, who has been here a few weeks and his hope will remain permanently among us. And uh, this is a pretty exciting thing for uh, Samuel Meyer Weiss. He was paid $750 a year, which was a huge increase in salary. And uh, this was, was quite exciting. Now, uh, what he was coming to uh, was Appleton. And I want to quote from Ken Silverman's book on uh, those early days. But Meyer Samuel could scarcely have found himself a nicer situation. Set amid farms, meadows, and woods, Appleton was a classic American small town, a progressive, expanding place of nearly 7,000, surrounded by flourishing towns like itself. Appleton supported three newspapers, two fire companies, several hotels and banks, and retail stores galore. Humming paper mills powered by the Fox River converted grain from the nearby fields into flour and forests of white pine into paper. It would be difficult to find in the very center of civilization, came the local crescent, a more intelligent or genial community than this. Isn't that what our community is all about? You might want to use that for some of your uh, promotional materials of, of uh, uh, this, this particular group. So in 1878, uh, in June, uh, Cecilia Weiss brought uh, five kids from uh, Budapest. They left from Bremen, Germany on the Frisia, which was a 365-foot uh, steam uh, ship. A uh, long, uh, arduous journey. The cost for Cecilia was thirty dollars, and um, there were six hundred and twenty passengers that were on this particular boat that came to New York. And one of the things that people don't uh, realize is uh, that uh, in the eighteen uh, late eighteen seventies, uh, uh, Ellis Island was not created. Actually, they went to a place called Elephant Island, where they had the immigration. Uh, group that uh, would take care of people. Again, very difficult to see. You're going to have to uh, believe me, but in the middle of the page, this is from the ship's records, and Cecilia's noted her age and all of the children, and Eric, age three and a half, is on this. This particular document was recently found, uh, recently in the 90s, I'll say, by a researcher by the name of Ron Hilgert, and we published a book. Sid and I talking about this particular story, and this was definitive uh, proof of when Houdini came to America and the ship and who was coming with him and so forth. So we felt that that was a very important discovery from a research standpoint. Um, in the 1880s, uh, there was a census. Again, if you follow Houdini, uh, this is uh, the 1880s uh, Outagamie County census records, and again, I apologize for the the uh, blurriness of the slide uh, in the lower uh, corner there. They have uh, the Weiss family and identify where they uh, live uh, in Appleton Street. 
The other thing that was going on with uh, Appleton as it expanded was a growing population, but also the Jewish community was expanding. And while uh, uh, Rabbi Weiss was a respected uh, fellow, this growing uh, Jewish uh, community was bringing in people that were not necessarily from Hungary, even though Rabbi Weiss spoke German, uh, Hebrew, Hungarian. There was a faction of people that um, uh, were not uh, particularly interested in Rabbi Weiss. And uh, there's an article from 1882 talking about the plans that the Jewish uh, uh, congregation had to build a new synagogue. Uh, the same article talked about Rabbi Solomon joining uh, or coming to Appleton and uh, checking it out to see whether this was some place that he might be uh, interested in locating at a particular uh, time. So. And this, is, as you know, is Temple Zion, um, and it was thought of while Rabbi Weiss was uh, in Appleton, but he did not uh, stay to see it uh, completed. And losing this job was devastating for the family. Uh, here he is, and there were two kids that had been born since the Weisses had located at Appleton, and so this was uh, uh, Rabbi Weiss. His wife, Cecilia seven kids and no job. And uh, this uh, was a time of panic and concern. The family moved to Milwaukee and uh, was there for a number of years. There are stories of the Weiss family requesting uh, uh, coal and food from the Hebrew Relief Society. And it was quite difficult for the family because Samuel uh, Rabbi Weiss was unable to find any meaningful and long-term employment as he had in Appleton. This is a mystery that I would hope that uh, some of you might be able to help me with because I've seen this photograph in a number of different publications and it says that nine years of age, uh, Houdini and in the other pictures, there's an excel of uh, young boy there. schoolyard in Appleton, Wisconsin. I have yet to find anybody that has been able to identify this particular schoolhouse and it's a back of schoolhouse. And it's a mystery. Um, what I also learned in my research that while the Weiss family moved to Milwaukee, Eric was sent back to Appleton and he was here for two years. And this is a story of him being apprenticed to a lock and gunsmith in Appleton. And so part of the family stayed in, in uh, the Milwaukee area. Eric uh, was in Appleton for several years and uh, joined the family after this apprenticeship. There's some wonderful anecdotal stories. Don't know if they're true or not, but one of the stories was that one night uh, Eric Weiss, Harry Bean, uh, went up and down College Avenue unlocked every one of the doors <laughs> in, the in College Avenue. Can't substantiate that. Pretty nice story. There's also another story where the sheriff brought in a prisoner who was handcuffed and Gary um, picked the lock and uh, spelled it one way or anything like that, but the sheriff came back and was amazed at how uh, young Gary Weiss was able to get the, uh, the handcuffs off this, uh, uh, this uh, prisoner. And there are other uh, individuals who were, I guess, influential in, in uh, Harry Houdini's early life. He had a young friend by the name of Jack Huffler who uh, decided that he would put together a uh, small circus. And uh, Harry was excited about this. Uh, Appleton had been place where a number of traveling circuses had gone through town and these young boys thought that it might be something they'd like to do. What uh, Harry uh, did for his debut as an entertainer, and he did claim that uh, this was in uh, 1883. 
Yes, 1883, October 1883, where he did a high wire act and then he did a contortionist act where he would lean backwards and pick up a needle uh, in his teeth. And he got 35 cents for this great performance. <laughs> and his career uh, uh, took off from there. No, not really. Um, I think that the uh, this idea of his first attempt at show business is something which talks about how Harry Houdini was very observant, he um, was interested in many different things, and uh, gravitated toward um, entertainment. Uh, this is a photograph of him, one of his early jobs. He was a uh, messenger boy for two different uh, messenger companies. He uh, shined shoes. He sold flowers, and uh, you can imagine with a, a family of, of uh, seven people that uh, young uh, family members were felt an obligation to help the family out. Um, maybe this was difficult uh, because in the, this uh, uh, time frame, uh, Harry ran away from home, and uh, speculation is that one of the reasons that he did this was to find a job and that he could send money back home. On one of his exploits, he wanted to get to Texas and he took the wrong train and ended up in Kansas City. And we know this because he did send a telegram back to his parents telling them that he was okay. And then there's another wonderful story where he left Milwaukee and ended up um, under the care of a very kind family that thought that this was an orphan. They brought him into their home, and he stayed with them for a number of, of years until they realized that he did have a family, and that it might be a good idea that he go uh, that he would go home. So uh, that's something that is uh, quite interesting. Not finding any work in um, uh, Milwaukee, uh, Rabbi Weiss went to New York, um, and two years later, Eric. Uh, went to New York as well. Uh, he found a job there in a necktie factory where he um, would cut neckties. And that was where he also met a fellow by the name, name of uh, Jacob Hyman. This was in 1889. And Jacob Hyman uh, was the fellow that uh, introduced Harry Houdini to uh, the French, famous French uh, magician by the name of Eugene Robert Houdin, and suggested that perhaps if you just take that Houdin name and add an I to that, that would sound pretty professional, and they thought that was a, a neat thing. They put together an act called the Houdini Brothers, and Jack uh, Hyman and Harry Houdini were the Houdini Brothers. I've got a number of things on the table over there uh, of memorabilia, two very early scrapbooks, and one of the pages is open to a, a letter that Jack Hyman wrote to Harry Houdini and signs it uh, Jack Houdini, and uh, um, ultimately he sold his uh, um, part in the act uh, back to, uh, to Harry, so there, was a, there were no longer the Houdini brothers, um, just Harry. This is an early uh, photograph of, of Houdini in his magician's memory uh, regalia. And uh, in those early days, it was pretty tough going. Dime museums were probably the lowest of the low as it relates to uh, entertainment. And he had a difficult time finding different opportunities to perform, but I guess if you got the show business bug and your bit, you will keep at this. And I have to say, in reading about Houdini in his early life, this was really, really difficult going. Uh, the next thing that uh, he uh, was able to do was find a wife. And on Coney Island, he met Wilhelmina Rahner, Bess, and they uh, married. And uh, Houdini's real brother, Hardeen, had been part of the act, and best replaced 
Hart Yeen, and they went out on the road and did some amazing tricks like the metamorphosis, which is the substitution trunk, which is pictured here. And uh, they uh, began to tour uh, around the country at various uh, locations. And in the 1890s, they hooked up with the Welsh Brothers Circus. And there are some wonderful photographs of these early circus performers and Harry and Bess, uh, who took part in a number of different things. Because he was so low on the rung, uh, and not reading the fine print of his first contract with Welsh Brothers Circus, one of the things that he was asked to do was to play a wild man from Borneo. And he was uh, in this cage and fed raw meat, and uh, he thought that was pretty fun and uh, enjoyed that opportunity. But the, uh, uh, again, uh, and he also liked the food, I guess, with uh, what, uh, but when you're in the circus, you encounter interesting people, uh, there were sideshow acts and people with physical deformities. Uh, they've talked about uh, people that were armless and could manipulate their toes like fingers. And Harry picked up on a number of these types of things and really learned how to promote himself through the ways in which the American circus promoted itself in uh, uh, this type of entertainment. So. Uh, Harry's really not much of a, of a star at this time in the 18, uh, 1890s. And I mentioned my friend Sid Radner. My first time to visit him in, in Holyoke, Massachusetts, he said, I want to show you a scrapbook of early um clippings. And I said, Sid, um, is there anything about Appleton, Wisconsin? And I said, gee, I know, I haven't looked at this for a long period of time. Uh, let's go to the office. My plane was uh, leaving shortly, and we just took a look at this crumbling uh, scrapbook, and we're turning pages very gently, and I saw Milwaukee, Racine, Menasha, and then Aha, Eureka, Appleton. And from the March uh, 29, 1897 uh, paper, uh, the handcuffs were easy. Harry Houdinus, I guess they couldn't spell back then. The, the magician with Rogers Orpheum stars would be a hard man for the police to keep in custody. Chief Hofer placed on Houdini's wrist three separate pairs of cuffs. Manacled in this manner and with the keys in the officer's pockets, the magician retired to the brew room and in five minutes reappeared, the cuffs off and locked together in a string. Mr. Houdinus is an old Appleton boy having lived in this city several years and has many friends here. Now, the Menasha uh, uh, clipping also uh, inspired me to maybe do another little bit of research and going over to the uh, Menasha library, I was able to find the ad for the Rogers Orphan Stars. And here we have the playbill of what uh, was going on uh, during the performances in Appleton at the Opera House. And you can see the very first act uh, uh, are the Houdinis and their wonderful Hindu box history, the metamorphosis trunk. And there's also uh, La Petite Bessie, a character vocalist, and later down in the, in the playbill, the mysterious Harry, the only rival of Herman the Great, uh, doing his magic act, and uh, that was quite a fun ex and exciting uh, discovery for me. But there were, there was other promotional activities going on, and you can see in the middle from April 1st, uh, the Appleton Weekly Post, Mr. Weiss finds many old friends. Uh, it talks about him uh, in the early uh, days. Uh, he was going... Uh, from one end of the, of the city of Appleton to the other, looking up friends. Uh, he mentioned to them he had seen many changes. He scarcely recognized the vicinity of the Fox River Paper Company's plant. It was near here that he narrowly escaped being drowned one day while swimming and was only saved by a heroic effort on the part of one of his playmates. And then it talks about he also studied and practiced uh, for a, a considerable time in London and went on and on about his exploits. Well, being the entertainer that he was, Houdini was a couple years away from actually being in London. Maybe he met London and Ontario. He had never been to London, England. But I think in saying, hey, 
I made good, uh, local boy, I'm a big magic uh, performer, this is something that would be uh, wonderful, uh, and isn't that great? Houdini continued to really struggle, but near the end of the 1890s, uh, the handcuffs escapes, uh, the ways in which he promoted uh, his escapes, the uh, metamorphosis, and other types of stunts that he did really got the attention of a gentleman by the name of Martin Beck, who was uh, with the Orpheum Vaudeville Circus. And uh, near the end of the 18, uh, 1899, Houdini was a top star in, in that vaudeville circus. And it was Beck who had the idea, we should send you to Europe. There's lots of uh, opportunities over there. And this is a copy of Houdini's application for his first passport in 1900. And again, I apologize for the clarity here, but you can see very clearly in the middle, he signed it, not Harry Houdini, Eric Weiss. And he does say that he was born April 6, 1873, mm -hmm. uh, that he uh, immigrated to the United States, uh, sailing on board, didn't know the name of the, uh, of the uh, um, ship, from Bremen and on or about uh, July 1878. And so Houdini definitely recognizes on an official document that where he was born and when he came to the United States. And actually this document was the document that Ron Hilbert used to trace back the passenger list on the Frisia to find that discovery. So in 1900, Harry Houdini definitely knew uh, where he was born. When he hit uh, London, he didn't have a single contract. He had a stunt where he escaped from Scotland Yard, and from then on, his career absolutely took off like a rocket, and he was uh, a sensation in London. He was hired at the Hippodrome, and doing this uh, handcuff escape uh, was something that was just totally unheard of. And I think the other part that is something that people don't quite recognize about Houdini is that uh, there's one thing to say, here are my handcuffs, and you put them on me and I'll get out of them. It's an entirely different thing when the entertainer said, you bring your handcuffs and I'll get out of them. And Houdini had a rather cocky attitude uh, that they talked about as an American performer, and I think that it was so different from what the European audiences had seen that this is why uh, this uh, changed, but he had a tremendous uh, success. He uh, wrote a childhood friend by the name of Montgomery, who was a pharmacist in uh, Appleton, and Mr. Montgomery would go to the papers and talk about, remember Eric Weiss, he's a big deal in Europe. This is talking about him escaping from a, uh, uh, a cell in, in uh, uh, Moscow, and uh, in the letter that Houdini wrote to Montgomery, he, he puts in this, if you manage to find time, you can write me in Moscow, how is your family and what news is there about Appleton? So even as a big name, uh, very uh, uh, famous, or becoming a very famous entertainer, Houdini continued to be interested in Appleton. And there's also another little uh, follow-up to the correspondence with Montgomery. Montgomery sent Houdini some clippings, and apparently there was an article about how the Tsar was treating Jews in Russia, and Houdini sent it back to Montgomery, with, where the government, Russian government, had blocked out all the different um, uh, references to this. Um, the more things change, the more things change, the sort of say the same. Um, you can see that Houdini continued to have correspondence with a number of different people. This is a photograph that many of you have seen, and again, what people are in their underwear and shackled with these kinds of devices. I have a, a leg iron, and which is of the period, and then I actually have on the table a, a pair of handcuffs that uh, Houdini uh, used. One of the greatest escapes that Houdini uh, had was uh, in London and a very famous specially made set of handcuffs called the Mirror Handcuffs. This is after the Daily Mirror. And it took Houdini about an hour to get out of these handcuffs. He thought that this was going to be a failure. But 
to show you or demonstrate to you the excitement that Houdini created during his acts, I want to read what the newspaper said after he had escaped from this. With a great shout of victory, Houdini bounded from the cabinet, holding the shining hat because he in his hand, free. A mighty roar of gladness went up. Men waved their hats, shook hands one with the other. Ladies waved their handkerchiefs, and the committee, rushing forward as one man, shouldered Houdini and bore him in triumph round the arena. But the strain had been too much for the handcuffed king, and he sobbed as though his heart would break. I mean, this is an absolutely uh, outpouring of emotion and respect and appreciation for what Houdini uh, did. And I think this whole symbol of escape is quite a metaphor of what uh, people in, in Europe and anybody who would feel that they're oppressed, and I think it was also one of the uh, ideas of what America was able to produce, this opportunity, this escaping from your uh, life in, um, uh, in your day-to-day -day time. Again, in uh, July of 1904, there's an article in the, in the uh, uh, paper uh, talking about Houdini being in New York and uh, uh, his past history of where he lived. Um, I'll read this quote. The handcuffed king has always had a warm place in his heart for Appleton and intends to visit the scenes of his childhood before returning to Europe. He's expected the last of the month he has to visit his manager in Chicago, and his, his intention to run up here for a day or two while on his western trip. His brother was here last week, so it wasn't even just Harry that had a warm spot for Appleton, even Hardeen had a warm spot for uh, Appleton. Okay, this is a photograph of Edna Ferber, and uh, Edna Ferber was a reporter with the Appleton Post, and she had a, a view of, of her life in Appleton. Uh, big news rarely broke in our well-conducted little town. I would pray for a murder, but I never got an answer to my prayers. <laughs> in all the years of our life there, not a single murder or even a robbery of anything uh, more than a turnip field, an apple orchard, or perhaps a trinket filched from a store counter ever marred the peace at this thriving Wisconsin town. The Appletonians worked, lived, uh, were content, behaved as civilization does when it is not frightened and resentful. And there's a wonderful story that uh, uh, Edna Ferber printed in the 1904 paper, but I like her story that was printed in her autobiography when she talked about uh, meeting Houdini, and she said, celebrities didn't come our way often. When Houdini, the handcuff king, arrived with his show, he got shorter shrift than he deserved, being a hometown boy. Before my day, he had been a local product, Harry Weiss, the son of a Russian Jewish rabbi. Failing to find him at his hotel or at the theater, I encountered him by chance on College Avenue at the drugstore corner across from the Crescent office. Outside the store was the usual slot machine containing chocolate and chewing gum. As he chatted affably with me, Houdini leaned carelessly against uh, the machine. At the end of the interview, he dropped a cold metal object into my hand. There is the padlock to the slot, mach or to the slot machine, he said. <laughs> Better give it to the drugstore man. Somebody will steal all his chocolate and gum. I hadn't even seen uh, so much as a movement of his finger. Tottering with admiration, I went back to the office to write my story. And Houdini would meet Edna Ferber in New York, and there's a quote that, in the letter, which is at the uh, Audi Gaming Museum, that between uh, you and me, uh, we've done more to promote Appleton than any, any other people. So. But uh, business was so great in Europe, uh, he invited, uh, Harry invited his brother Hardeen over, and Hardeen had also a very uh, profitable career. Uh, at this time, Houdini was making about $2,000 a week, which in those days was uh, stunning uh, amounts. The, the connection with Appleton continued in 1905. Uh, there was another article that uh, talked about uh, the family and uh, this fortune that he uh, acquired and uh, uh, 
that he still speaks of Appleton as his home. In 1906, uh, this was a report in the Appleton Crescent about Harry Udini coming back and betting that he could get out of the new county jail. And um, this is a story where Udini backed down. Now, this particular story, which I find quite interesting, uh, I'm not sure that this is substantiated. This could be something that was fabricated, but um, I want to do a little more <coughs> and uh, study on this thing. This is a picture of uh, Harry's mother on the left and his, his wife Bess in uh, 1907, and this is when they are in Europe, and again, he's at the height of his powers. And I'd like to show this next area, which is a bridge jump that Houdini did in 1907 in Rochester, New York. And I hope that this will give you some, some sense of the excitement of what's going on. And I was in Rochester, New York, and read a, uh, a, an account of this particular escape. And they filmed this escape, and that night they showed this uh, movie of the escape in the movie theaters. And it's just wonderful. YouTube is a great thing. And it's wonderful that these types of, um, of uh, examples of Houdini undressing can be viewed by us today. But you can see uh, a committee of uh, official looking people from the police department. Um, uh, Houdini's got a couple of his assistants that are there. But he, you know, this guy does not have any fear. He is absolutely confident about uh, moving forward, and um, this particular river is dried up now, so uh, if it was today, he would jump into a street. But there he is up on the top of the bridge. He's probably yelling something out to the folks. Are you ready to go? Houdini was a great swimmer, by the way, won medals as a young, young man. Off he goes. And up he comes. Free from his shackles. Hooray, Houdini! <laughs> Again, continuing on this theme of, uh, of Houdini uh, coming back to Appleton in 1912, there's an article in the Crescent. Houdini, the famous handcuff king, who as a small boy lived in Appleton, is giving an exhibition in Milwaukee this week, and said, I, in a few days, I'm going with my wife and my mother to Appleton to see the old landmarks. I have my mother with me, and oh, but she is a mother. And this is around the time where Houdini had uh, also uh, flown, uh, been the first person to fly an airplane in Australia, so he con continues to add to his credibility. Um, this is a wonderful letter uh, that he sent to uh, his brother uh, Hardeen. I won't read the whole thing, but uh, on the very bottom it talks about, I actually dreamt of Appleton, Wisconsin a short time back and beheld Pa and Ma drinking coffee under the trees in that park. That's Tallulah Park. Park. Um, yeah. Houdini often would reflect back on, on uh, and said the most, the best time that he had uh, was, uh, and the family had, was in Amazon because they were all together. Now this is a very interesting letter because it's to the post, postmaster of Appleton, Wisconsin, and written in 1916. And specifically, the postman is asked when, um, uh, about uh, news from Appleton, and he talks about a number of the different stores, and he says, your letter has given me a longing to revisit my hometown, even if only to walk around the house in which I was born. And he talked about, again, the happiest times there. I've been kept in touch uh, with Appleton through Montgomery, the druggist, uh, with whose father-in-law, Mr. Brown, I was a great favorite many, many years ago. And in all my interviews, I mention Appleton with pride and think that I have boosted that little place as no other has done. So when, when um, the next one, please. So when Houdini would go and meet people, 
you can see that he would say Harry Houdini, uh, Harry Handcuff Houdini, born in Appleton, Wisconsin, April 6, 1874. This is in 1917. And then a, another letter in 1918 where specifically somebody asked him, where were you born? First of all, next to Claire, I was born in Appleton, Wisconsin, April 6, 1874. So Houdini is definitely getting into this idea that he was born there. Well, 1918, 1916, 1914, what's going on? World War I. And uh, this... Uh, jovial, happy community that welcomed everybody. Uh, when you're at war with a particular uh, uh, empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Germany, uh, you don't want to claim that you're from, uh, from Hungary. You want to be an American. And I think this is where this transformation came. And Houdini was out selling war bonds and really promoting. He had tried to enlist, but he, they said he was too old. And he went off to be one of the uh, most successful war bond salesmen and giving shows and throughout the country. So as I end up here, uh, this is the way in which I like to think of Houdini uh, at the height of his powers, uh, very confident, very um, uh, distinguished, uh, very successful, and uh, not only did he have a fabulous career in Europe, but came back to the United States and extended that in a uh, wonderful way. I'm not going to talk about um, his uh, latter part of his career, but this is the cemetery where Houdini is buried in New York. With that, I will end my presentation. And if you'd like to ask questions, I'm more than happy to do that. And I appreciate your attention very much.